So good afternoon, everyone uh, in the Philippines. Good evening in Australia. My contribution to this forum is on the topic that Ivan gave me. And considering that we do have an international audience, I had to be specific that I will be talking about the Cordillera Highlands in the Philippines and not another Cordillera elsewhere in Latin America. I added the subtopic discussion points for collaborative action because I would like to believe that this forum is part of a process that can move towards a process. I hope and wish that the modest, con modest contribution I make through this presentation would be of use to everyone. As um, the previous speakers have indicated, there's a lot of work to do and it is exciting. Right. So talking about our mining heritage in the Cordillera, where I happen to come from, um, would be to talk about the mines, all right? The Philippines is rich in metallic mineral deposits, particularly in copper, gold, nickel, chromite, and in lesser amounts, iron, manganese, cobalt, platinum, zinc, name them, lead and molybdenum. And based on geology and distribution of known mineral deposits, the Philippines has been divided into 12 mineralized zones and on the top, is the region of the Cordillera, right? In the northern part of Luzon, which is the largest island group of the Philippines, it is the mountainous region called Cordillera, all right? Uh, that it's enlarged in the right um, uh, map. Cordillera literally means mountain chains forming like a backbone. Whilst mineral resources are found in sundry places all over the Philippine archipelago, the Cordillera region has been the location of the country's pioneer gold and copper mines, which have been among the country's top producers for many decades. Mining in the Cordillera has been centered in the province of Benguet, my birthplace, which has been the nucleus of a lot of traditional mining long before the Spanish colonialists set foot uh, in the islands. So the Cordillera has been the nucleus of longest operating large-scale mines and where artisanal mining has been the livelihood of uh, the Ibaloy, the Can Canal in particular in Mancayan. All right, so within the province of Benguet is the municipality of Itogon, right? Right down there at the bottom. And um, it comprises Antamok, Akupan, and Balato, localities that have been associated with gold mining even during the pre-colonial times. And there's a lot of um, documentation on this. Now, within Itogon is Benguet Corporation, which was incorporated in 1903 with its first underground mine in Antamok, and production began in 1906. And um, a few years later, this company established another mine, the Akupan mine, and production began in 1927. And adjacent Benguet Corporation is another mining company called Felix Mining Corporation. And I'm referring particularly to the Padkal mine, the mother mine. I say mother mine because at the minute, Padkal mine or Felix Mining Corporation has expanded to other parts of the Philippines. So they are now in Sibutad, Zamboanga and Silangan, Surigao. Now, Felix Mining Corporation was incorporated in 1955 and began production in 1958. And it was the first block cave operation in the Far East. The last two decades have ushered the Padkal mine of Felix Mining Corporation into a period of lower ore grades. Hence, planning has been underway for its closure. So here comes the opportunity for uh, industrial heritage, you know, inventory, identification, appraisal, whatever work needs to be more appreciated and perhaps be invited. So it is projected to close in 2022. I was doing my PhD in the area in 2004, 2005, and people were talking about its closure in 2011. It hasn't closed because over time, while they're planning, for the closure, they're like planning an aircraft that's that's you know that's about to to fall, and yet they're still trying to make remedies. No, no, 
uh, that's a poor analogy. But what I'm saying is, while they're planning for the closure of the Padkal mine, they keep finding a few more ores around the vicinity. And so, as the Mining Act of the Philippines requires, five years before the final closure, they have to have the document of how to rehabilitate uh, the area. And you can just imagine how uh, the company has been trying to update and update and update its closure plan because up to 2014, 2024, I know, it's been changing. Now they're saying again that no, 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 they're not going to close in 2022 because they might hope and they may Yes, they, there are some positive responses or um, findings that they can still carry on beyond 2022, just a few years. But uh, we can't deny that the ores are already depleting. Now, let's go to the north, Mankayan. Up in the north is the Lepanto Consolidated Mining Company. That's where I was born. That's where my father worked. And um, that's where I learned what mining is all about. And little did I know that one day I'll still be working for the mining industry in Australia and in the Philippines. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that my um, field, which is not mining engineering, not geology, not metallurgy, but social sciences, particularly social development and social anthropology would bring me back to mining because the company that hired me in the Philippines needed some anthropologists in the social license activities of the company here in Australia, and the rest is history. So in Lepanto, it was organized in 1864, although the first Spanish claims on the Cordillera was as early as 1856. And in 1864, uh, a person by the name of Don Jose Maria Santos organized the Cantabro Filipino de Mancayan Company. And it operated for several years, but it had, it had to stop when that founder died. However, under the American regime, it was revived in 1933, incorporated in 1936, and built the country's first copper plant. So these three mining companies, you can see there's a lot of history there, a lot of uh, documentation needed. Now, Lepanto Consolidated Mining Company is now in its 85th year of operation because it turned 84 in September last year. And uh, the latest annual report that I was able to access was 2017, nothing later. It employs 1,815 workers. When I was doing my research in 2004, they had a bit more, but it's been dwindling that way. Okay, now you multiply that number by an average of four or five people per household or per family and you come up with a big number. Now, at the, in, 19, in 2019, the community of Lepanto alone is 9,000 plus, and the mining company has been um, carrying on ever since uh, through underground operation. Let's go to Benguet Corporation. How old is it now? 117 years. But like I mentioned earlier, Lepanto is actually much older because it began during the Spanish time. Is that, yeah? That, does, does that make sense? Anyway, so since 1903, the Baguio Gold operation, which consists of underground, several underground operations were um, controlled by Benguet Corporation. Baguio Gold Operation Mines alone employed as many as 6,000 miners and engineers in 1986. So there's over 30,000 population spread across its mining sites in Antamok, Akupan, Balato. If you add the smaller camp sites, there will be 5,000 more, that's 35,000. And you're talking about the operations of Benguet Corporation in Itogon alone. You're not talking about their operations in Zambales and elsewhere. Anyway, so Antamok Mine shifted from underground to open pit operation in the 1980s. Why is that? Because they've been losing money and uh, um, mineral ores have been depleting. And so they had to um, get to the surface and mine the remaining ores. 
And so the open pit operated from 1992 until 1998. And uh, contract mining with um, small scale miners began in 2000 in a coupon mine. It's still operating up to now. Let's go to Felix. Felix is now 65 years since 1955. It used to have almost 2000 employees in its heyday. That's from 70s to 1980s. And uh, uh, it built the Felix community, which used to have 17,000 population. It's been dwindling because the company has been reducing its manpower towards its closure and toward, because uh, ores have been declining. But Felix, like its, um, um, I mean, the other companies have made its name on its own. Uh, it built um, the first uh, block cave in the 1960s. And this is not just in the Philippines. It was the first one in the Far East. So that's a brief historical background of the three companies that I'm talking about. Mind you, these three companies are not just uh, the leading companies in the region, but in the country. Now, all three mining companies have built mine site communities. When I say mine site communities, these are the communities of um, the employees with their young families. If we look at our present situation, it was like uh, the mining companies, the mine site communities during the period after World War II, because they're, they're getting back to operation after the interruption of World War II, are like the forerunners of our present day overseas. It's like they're all from, uh, you know, the provinces, but they had to leave um, farming in order to go find the greener pastures. So they go to Lepanto, they go to Felix, they go to Antamok, Balato, or Akupan. By the way, Lepanto Consolidated Mining Company took its name from the place, which is Lepanto, which, uh, if you look at the background, was a name given by the Spaniards because of their knowledge about the Battle of Lepanto. The, what's this, the, the fierceness of the Turks were compared by the Spaniards to the fierceness of the Igorot, my ancestors, um, well, not my, my, my fellow um, Igorot. And so they named the place Lepanto. So Lepanto was named, was taken as the name of the company, whereas um, Benguet Corporation also took the names of the places, um, Antamok, Balatok, Akupan, Mine. But in Felix, Felix was not named Felix. The company was the one bearing the name Felix. And then the place, which was Padkal in Tuba, Benguet, took the name of the place. So this is Felix. Now, all three mining companies commenced operations before, long before what we now know as the requisites of corporate social responsibility, social license to operate before such terms entered the lexicon of the mineral sector, but which for their own benefit have had to build roads and other transport facilities. So they're the ones, the mining companies were the ones that opened the hinterlands, the mountain regions to the world because they needed the roads for them to transport their minerals for export. And then of course, all three mining companies provided the necessary amenities of everyday, everyday living. Thus, they had to build cities or towns in the hinterlands. Why is that? Well, it was necessary for them to secure their workforce. Otherwise, if they don't provide housing, um, security, hospitals, libraries, movie houses, schools, and other things, other uh, facilities, other provisions, other services, what would you expect with the workers? They would not know what OWL means. So we proceed to the mine camps. I, I'd like to manage my time. The mine camps are the communities of evolved identities. My research area has, is actually not on industrial, industrial stuff per se, but more on the non-tangible um, ones, such as the stories, the identities, the evolution, the transition of um, living, and labeling 
of the Tagaminas, anak ng Mina, anak ng Lepanto, and we have that very strong. Anyway, over several decades, there has been the symbiotic relationship between the mining companies and the respective mine site communities that emerge out of their operations. And of course, the company managers, which were the Americans at the time until the Filipinization of mining companies in the 1970s, these managers have learned early that their communities of mine workers and their families are integral to their efficient and continuing operation. So the companies provided housing, medical dental services, as I was saying, schools, uh, churches, libraries, theaters, sports facilities, postal services, banks, market facilities, name them. So these were a self-operating uh, or self-sufficient, in quotation marks, communities in the mountains. And these are all free. And uh, one of the heritage, if, if you talk of mining heritage and you talk about people who were born in the mining communities, they will talk about their education as the real heritage that they had because uh, it was free uh, elementary education and it was quality because the companies really provided a lot of, um, a lot of resources. Um, and then towards high school, uh, it's highly subsidized. If only there were tertiary educa educational institutions in those mines, I did not have to go to UP Baguio. But that wasn't the case. So yung mga anak ng mina, uh, the children of the mines like myself, had to finish high school in the mine site communities and then move to the cities, Manila or Baguio. Now, let's go to the more specific communities. Let me start with Lepanto. It's a major of um, young men with their young families after World War II. Um, I've been putting photos because they speak a lot. And uh, you've got the airstrip there, which has been a big part of the childhood memories of anyone from Lepanto and you've got the old buildings. All right, these are the houses. Okay, on the left top, that's gone. That was demolished recently. I'm glad I took a photo of that in 2016. The one on the right, that's still existing and it is serving accommodation to uh, visitors in Lepanto, you have to pay. These were built by the Americans after the war. And of course, down below are the bank houses, okay. In mining communities, and it is true for all mining communities, Benguet Corporation, Lepanto or Felix, there is a very, very distinct caste system, I call it. The managers, the superintendents have different types of housing from that of the families of the workers who are low ranking like my dad. So we live in bank houses like this. Am I still making sense? Yeah. Hi, Mini. We'll have the time short because uh, we have uh, five speakers to follow. Okay, okay. I'll make it fast now. Okay. Felix is that one. This one will should not go when Felix is going to close. All right. Those are... That's what you find in Felix. Now, Akupan Balato, that bank house is already gone. And um, here is the Akupan mine. Now, the largest of a cluster of several gold mines. Um, I'm doing it quick. I'll just show you. Okay. Now, in Akupan and Balato, and this was mentioned by Roberto, is Benguet Corporation's uh, ecotourism, which is the Balato Mines Tour, to showcase the... Uh, mining heritage in the Cordilleras, but this is not in operation at the minute because uh, it's being refurbished. And then that's the museum. And an added feature of the Balatuk mine tour was the company's former tailings dam for fishing and canoeing. Um, and then come to Antamok. Wait, Antamok no longer looks like anything. The houses are gone. This is what you find. Okay, so this is what you see. And um, the open pit is still gaping and around it 
are the houses of small scale miners. Now, I pose a few questions uh, when we talk about mining heritage. Uh, we're talking about two types of mining and it's not just the large scale corporate mining that I was talking about. Of course, I have not included the small scale mining and that's a big part of our mining heritage. And these are overlapping, all right? In the Philippines, the business of mining includes many players and the key actors include a lot. And of course, when we talk about mining heritage, you will add Department of Tourism and CCA, ANI, and who else? You will add uh, every one of you, okay? The key questions that I'm now asking as I was putting this presentation, and this is my last slide, by the way, who are the lead actors? What resources are available? How much of the past must be preserved, protected, or managed? And this is my bias. How can communities be involved in identifying or inventorying, appraisal, classifying, and other activities? And uh, the ones in yellow are my um, interest the social identities and symbolic communities and their role in heritage management. Management, And I have not talked about the persistent issues about legacy mines or what we call the abandoned and orphaned mines in the Philippines. And this is where I end. Thank you for listening.